have all interacted with patients who are truly seeking relief from pain or whose lives have been traumatically affected by the use of opiates. While cannabis is now an option, it is clear that we need to know more. We are asked on a daily basis, will medical marijuana help me? What type of strain should I be taking for my condition? It is only through diligent and thorough research that these questions can truly be answered. In an effort to do so, we have invited Dr. Sue Sicily to Las Vegas to join us as the medical director of The Grove. With her, we have discovered the barriers to research are far more extensive than we were first led to believe. Today, this fantastic panel has come together to discuss these challenges. With that being said, please enjoy this innovative and enlightening conversation. I will now turn it over to Nevada State Senator Tick Sagerblum, who is a vital advocate for cannabis in Nevada and has graciously agreed to moderate today's discussion. Thank you so much. Um, I would just, um, before I get too far, I just want to say how proud I am to be here. Uh, and also, just a little history. Two years ago, I brought Dr. Sicily here to UNLV. She had an FDA approved study, but she couldn't find a university that would work with her. So I brought her to here to UNLV, hoping that UNLV would be enlightened and let, let her do her study here in Nevada, which would have been perfect. And of course, she spent a day here, talked to everyone, and then they said, oh, this is too dangerous. We can't do this. And now two years later, she got the study approved. She has universities, and we lost out. So it's sad. But with showing you what the progress we've had, two years later, Sue, we are here in, at UNLV hosting a medical, medical marijuana symposium. Uh, so there is progress in life. So, but anyway, um, this is, is so exciting for me to, to um, see where this, this has come and the fact that, that Places like the Grove, dispensaries like the Grove, um, are now reaching out to the community. We have a vibrant medical marijuana uh, program. Our dispensaries are fantastic. Our grows are fantastic. We have a variety of things, uh, options out there. Um, so Nevada is becoming, as I've always predicted, a center for medical marijuana, and hopefully it can become the center for medical marijuana research because that's really the, the missing element here. We know from anecdotal experience that it works, but we don't have any scientific studies that say, take this, this is what it does, and that's where we need to go from here. But th I, I believe, all my heart, that Las Vegas is the perfect place to have those studies, and hopefully this will be the start of that. For today's panel, I'll just um, briefly introduce everybody, and then each person will speak for about 10 minutes, and afterwards we'll have questions. Uh, first, Dr. Sisley, who I mentioned before, um, world famous. Um, She's a hippie today, but <laughs> so I think she's reliving her uh, undergraduate days. <laughs> but um, anyway, she, she, she single-handedly reached out and got the FDA to make the first approved study of medical marijuana. So for that, she deserves our everlasting thanks. So give her a round of applause for that. <laughs> it really just took a lot of, of energy, a lot of chutzpah, and just to get out there. So thank you, Sue. But um, anyway, she'll, she'll talk about what she's doing. John Hudak, who is here, for, he's with the Brookings Institute. As I tell people, to have medical marijuana or marijuana and the Brookings Institute in the same sentence is a miracle in itself. Uh, but anyway, John has done lots of studies, uh, economic studies, uh, other studies of programs. He's looked at what we do here in Nevada, and he's got lots of ideas for where we need to go and things we need to watch out for. So having him here uh, is fantastic. Uh, Dr. Or Dr. Farley, I, I raised your... Uh, <laughs> Senator Farley, when we're senators, we're like doctors, we can be anything. We write the law. But anyway, Senator Farley um, is just a, a, a really refreshing um, person to have in the, the state legislature. Um, I don't know where she came from, but she just appeared out of magic. She's like an angel and just said, you know, I think this marijuana thing is legitimate and has worked with me and with the other legislators to make sure that our program is, is succeeds. And now she's the leader of, frankly, the marijuana movement. So I'm just kind of like following in her footsteps and saying, what do you want me to do now, um, Fatty? So anyway, so thank you so much for being here and what you're doing. <laughs> and and she will be, she's not up for re-election, so she's up for two more years. So 2017 session where we're going to have a ton of marijuana things to do. She will be leading that fight. So stay in touch with her. 
And, and finally, um, Eugene Monroe is here, and I don't know if you've read about him, but just recently he's become very prominent uh, because as a professional athlete, he just stood up and said, you know, enough's enough. I'm not going to take it anymore. Uh, this deserves to be researched. Uh, NFL players should have a right to use medical marijuana. Um, and, you know, to his credit, he just on his own has, has created a movement. So thank you, Eugene. We're going to hear from him. But please. Thank you. I can tell you, uh, representing whistleblowers in my private practice, um, when somebody stands up like that, people go, oh my god. And then all of a sudden, people start to follow him and say, wait a minute, the guy's not crazy. He's making sense. <laughs> And, and it becomes a movement. It's just, it's amazing. But it takes the one person who, who, and that's what we have, frankly, here. We have four people who just kind of stood up, said, I'm just going to tackle this. Uh, and everybody said, oh, you can't do that. That's, that's going to destroy your career. That's going to be whatever. And lo and behold, here we are. So I guess we're all kind of rebels in that sense. But anyway, thank you all for coming. And for that, I will go ahead and introduce Dr. Cicely for 10 minutes. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just, while they're finding my slides, I'll give you a quick intro. Oh, there we go. Let's see if this works here. Okay. So I wanted to give you guys just a, a quick overview of the barriers to research so that you um, had a deeper understanding of the myriad ways that our U.S. government has systematically impeded cannabis efficacy research in the U.S. Um, one of the things I want to point out is just how absurd it is that in, in the U.S. it's easier to study any other drug in Schedule I except marijuana. So it's easier for me to, to do research on LSD, MDMA, magic mushrooms, any of the other psychedelics in Schedule I, um, but in, uh, you know, next to impossible to study cannabis. And our saga, trying to get our study implemented, many of you know that we've been trying to, um, for the last seven years, We've been trying to implement a randomized controlled trial looking at whole plant cannabis for military veterans with PTSD. That was the study that Tick was um, referencing. And uh, even though we submitted the study design back in 2009, here we are almost seven years later still unable to even enroll our first veteran despite hurtling all of the federal obstacles. Um, but I want to give you a glimpse of what these obstacles really are. From my perspective, this is just sort of classic federal government overreach. They're you know, micromanaging uh, and creating additional layers of government red tape that are completely unnecessary. So in order to study any controlled substance in this country, you have to go through these three agencies, which is fine. We're not disputing that at all. Um, but the challenge is that if you want to study cannabis, you have to go through these two additional layers of government red tape. Um, so we put them side by side just so you could see if you compare studying heroin versus cannabis, you can see there were these two additional agencies that you have to jump through. And these agencies have no timeline. That's the problem. That's where the government is able to stonewall this work. At each of these junctures, there is um, time for these agencies to leave paperwork on their desk for months and months and never look at it, um, or look at it and just ignore it. Um, and that's what, what happened. I'll give you an example. In our study, um, we, we are required, all marijuana trials were required to go through a public health service review, which is a redundant review that occurs after we've already achieved FDA approval. And so what happened is, you know, PHS review, again, has no timeline. It took them three years to approve our protocol, which is uh, absurd. I mean, it doesn't you know, it, they didn't require any protocol changes at the end of those three years. And during that time, 24,000 veterans killed themselves in this country, which is why uh, I'm wearing, you see these dog tags from the veterans community. They engrave the number 22 in this to help build awareness about this epidemic of veteran suicide in the country. And the fact is, I don't know if cannabis could have helped curb this epidemic of veteran suicide, but I certainly think we need to be asking those questions through the process of rigorous controlled trials, and we haven't been allowed to do that. So finally, our study was approved in March of 2014, but the good news was that 
after we are, got our approval, we fought to um, persuade the government to end this, uh, this redundant review, and we did. In, in last year, Obama announced the end of the PHS review. So you can see, I wanted to give you some hope that things are slowly changing, um, but we still have one major barrier to deal with, and that is the DEA monopoly, right? So why is it that my study is fully funded? We have basically you know, hurdled all the federal obstacles, but we're still not able to start. This is why. The DEA has, you know, or DEA grants NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, a government-enforced monopoly on the only federally legal supply of cannabis for any of these, you know, randomized controlled trials. So anyone, anytime you want to do an experimental design around cannabis, you're required to buy your study drug from the University of Mississippi. So NIDA has given them, in, back in 1968, they granted them the only um, license to, to grow cannabis for research. And the problem is that um, if they don't like your study, they can simply refuse to sell you study drug and then you, your research is impossible to conduct. And that's what we're, we're challenging. You can see here, this is Dr. El Soli. He's the head of that facility at University of Mississippi. He has his hand in a barrel of ground up marijuana. That's how they deal with the study. They basically throw the entire plant into the grinder and then they roll it up into these cigarettes that are shipped out to investigators all over the country. So I don't want to give you the impression there's no research happening in the US. There's tons of marijuana research happening, spo you know, sponsored by the government, looking at harmful side effects of cannabis, right? We call those safety studies, looking at addiction potential of cannabis. So, there's tons of that research, but when it comes to looking at efficacy of marijuana, right, how effective is cannabis in treating a certain illness, those are the studies that are blocked by the government. And you can see here, this, when you dump out the contents of these cigarettes, which one of our um, collaborators has done in the past, and um, you can see the contents of this study drug. This is what we're required to use um, to study efficacy of cannabis, and it's uh, a lot of folks in the medical profession would argue that this sabotages the study from the beginning. Um, what we would like to use, of course, is primarily the flowering plant material, but we're forced to, you know, have all kinds of extraneous plant material. And the study drug is, is administered by weight, so the problem is if you have a lot of supplementary material in there, it can affect the outcome. So the question I'm going to leave you with is why is it that other countries feel comfortable to license other growers for research? You can see here, you know, because they know that they need to have an uninterrupted supply. Here's all the other countries that I've found that license multiple growers. There's probably many other countries that do this, but these are the most um, obvious that, you know, for instance, Israel has eight different manufacturers that are all licensed to grow cannabis for research. Um, the problem we have is that, you know, we don't have, they, they're not able to produce the strains that we're requesting. So the various phenotypes that we would like to use, they're not capable or, or willing to generate those. Um, for instance, we asked for a simple one-to-one -one ratio of 12% THC, 12% CBD, and we ended up, um, they notified us that they have something, a blended strain around 7%, 7%, not close to what we requested, but we have to accept it because this is it. This is what we're dealing with. Um, so they're not able to produce the strain. They don't share any information about the nature of the can. They don't, we don't know if it was grown with pesticides. We don't know what other cannabinoids are in it besides THC and CBD. We don't know the terpene profile, and we know terpenes are really important, you know, have a, are clinically active, and need to, we need to be aware of that. Um, so they won't turn over the drug master file that would provide all that information, but yet they're taking taxpayer dollars. So I ask, where is the transparency? Um, so the, the way the DEA has maintained this monopoly is by arguing that they, um, that international treaty allows them to keep this. So the DEA refuses to relinquish this monopoly despite, you know, decades of us challenging them. Um, and this is what, I'll leave you with this, Nora Volkow, we have some unlikely allies that have come forward to help us with this. So people are realizing the injustice of blocking this um, kind of important research. And so suddenly folks like Nora Volkow, who is the head of NIDA, um, you can see here, let me just uh, point it. So she testified at a U.S. Senate hearing last year and admitted that this NIDA monopoly has been a barrier to research. And when they asked her, um, you know, um, I think that she talks about, you know, would it be better 
um, to get rid of the monopoly. And she admitted, yes, it would be better. It would be, the, you know, research would be far more efficient if, it, if it did, the monopoly didn't exist. And finally, they asked her, is there any other Schedule One drug that has to deal with this monopoly? And she admitted, no. And that's the case, is when I want to do a study on LSD or MDMA or any other drug in Schedule One, I can buy research grade LSD or MDMA from any lab in the country. I don't have to go through NIDA to buy study drugs. So I think that's what we wanted to, to make, sh to share that with the public so they're aware of, um, uh, of the, the injustice of the system and why this research is being impeded. And now I'd, I'd like to invite John, is that okay, to come up? Because John is gonna give you the big world view of how this, uh, is he next? Okay, you got it. Let me invite John up here to continue this dialogue. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you to the organizers. Uh, thank you to UNLV uh, for hosting us today. Our, at Brookings, our partnership with uh, UNLV through our Brookings Mountain West program is one that is really important to the institution, and it lets uh, people like me come out and talk to uh, groups about a variety of topics. Um, marijuana is not typically what the Brookings Institution is known for studying, uh, but alas, uh, it's become a really important part of our policy portfolio over the past few uh, years. And so I've been uh, happy to be able to uh, engage in a lot of that. The organizers asked for someone who knew a lot about public policy uh, to come and, and talk about this topic. They also requested um, that we have a handsome athlete on the panel. I was happy to fill both of those roles. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so let, let me pick up where um, Sue left off. Uh, there's a reality in this country, and that is that over 165 million Americans live in states where the state, either through ballot initiative or through legislative action, has approved a full-fledged medical marijuana system. Hundreds of thousands of people medicate every day using marijuana, sometimes legally, more often than not illegally. Uh, they're self-medicating, they're self-dosing, they're taking guesses at what types of cannabinoids, uh, what types of strains are going to help them. A lot of times it's a trial and error process until they find uh, what works for them in conversations with people at dispensaries, um, in conversations sometimes with their doctors, though their doctors are usually uh, in the dark. And this is going on across America every day. But what's happening is the federal government is stopping the medical community, top-notch researchers like Sue, from answering these basic medical questions that exist that put patients at risk, that make patients waste money on strains that they don't know if it's going to help them. Again, go through this trial and error process, which is not a cheap one, until they finally find what works for them. Well, in the United States, our, our medical research is, is second to none in every area except one, and it's this one. Meanwhile, people in this country are using this product more than anywhere else in the world for medicinal benefit, and so we really owe it to them not, because of, not necessarily because it's the right thing to do. A lot of you would argue it is. But because there's a real public policy demand in the United States. And the longer we go without legitimate answers, it's an absolute embarrassment. It's an embarrassment that this government is unwilling to allow medical researchers to answer the questions that patients across the United States demand and need. And so what has the United States government done? They've set up formal barriers to this research. Sue covered a lot of them. Uh, marijuana is in Schedule One. It is considered to have no medicinal value. It can't be used safely in medical treatment in the United States, and it has a high uh, tendency toward abuse. Those are the three tiers, the three designations under Schedule One. Why is it there? Not because of medical evidence, not because of scientific evidence, but because Richard Nixon was a racist. Honestly, we've heard this from his staff. It was a political designation to put marijuana in Schedule One because Richard Nixon was afraid of hippies and afraid of African Americans, though he never used that term. Um, and so now we have a drug that most people realize is not as dangerous as heroin or LSD. Most people would argue it's much less dangerous than cocaine, which is a Schedule II drug. But it sits here, and that creates additional burdens for re researchers like Sue. It increases costs to universities and to research studies. 
It means that licensure is much harder to get. Compounding that with the informal barriers that get set up, like DEA not approving a license that's sitting on an administrator's desk for months or years. There's reduced funding, or there's targeted funding when it comes to marijuana research. For decades, the US government only funded a research proposal that had to do with marijuana if it talked about abuse. It denied them if it had anything to do with efficacy. Well, that's government corruption of science. And that's totally unacceptable in this country in most contexts. But it's been the absolute policy of the United States government for over 30 years. And that's a problem. But there are other informal barriers as well. There's a cultural bias in this country that has been generated because of a propaganda campaign from the government, but also because that propaganda campaign gets institutionalized into almost every corner of life, from education to medicine to academia. And that disincentivizes people from even pursuing the types of studies that Sue does. If you are a junior medical school faculty member, you don't have the tenure clock time to wait six or eight or 10 years for a study to begin. You lose your job. So that creates these informal disincentives that I think people uh, don't fully appreciate. Universities are afraid of this. And universities have a lot of clout to deny studies, to deny uh, people uh, uh, faculty positions. Sue knows this better than anyone. This university knows it better than anywhere else. And that's a, that's a real problem. And so what's the result? As I said, we have a ton of patients in this country who are demanding better answers. And their government is coming in between doctors and patients. We have a lot of, we have a lot of rhetoric in this country, particularly around uh, medicine, particularly around health care, particularly around the Affordable Care Act, where no one wants the government to come between them and their doctor. But it's OK when it comes to medical marijuana. And every day that the government continues to pursue these types of policies, whether it's Schedule One status, whether it's the NIDA monopoly, which is creating or, or is generating an insufficient supply to researchers uh, across the US, whether it is relying on blatant lies about uh, international treaties for a basis for continuing the NIDA monopoly, whether it is using propaganda campaigns to continue cultural biases, whatever they're doing, they're coming in between doctors and patients. They're violating the sanctity of that relationship, which is so crucial for healthcare. And again, it's an absolute embarrassment that a government that prides itself in being premier in the world in terms of producing medical research and answers to important scientific questions is being left in the dust by a lot of other countries. There's a market opportunity, there's an academic opportunity, and there's a healthcare opportunity that every day the United States turns its back on. So what can we do? First, we can reschedule marijuana. That's easy. I don't think it's going to happen this summer. The DEA might surprise me. But there's an opportunity to reschedule it. What will that do? It will begin to break down some of those administrative and bureaucratic barriers that prevent great researchers like Sue from answering the important questions that most people in this room are, are, are dying to know. We can have better funding. We can have less targeted funding. Funding that doesn't just focus on marijuana abuse, but focuses on marijuana efficacy. Now, it's hard to get anything funded in the United States um, by the government, that's for sure. But we can do a better job in making sure that the funding that does exist reflects the public policy demands in this country. And one of the premier public policy demands when it comes to healthcare right now is that there are a lot of people using a drug that we don't know enough about. <coughs> There also needs to be presidential leadership. President Obama has shown some leadership on this issue. He could show a hell of a lot more. And the next president can do even more for this. Just raising the profile of medical marijuana, not as something that is anathema to society, not something that is uh, for the fodder of 1930s films that make you think it's going to turn you into a psychopath, but actually to raise it up and say, this is a product that people are using, and we need the best science to back up whatever the answer is. And frankly, whether you're an advocate in favor of medical marijuana or you're a staunch drug war prohibitionist, you should want this research to be done. Because if you think marijuana is terrible, let the science show it. Throw open the doors and let's see it. If you're scared of what the answer is, you probably know what the answer is. But if you're a supporter of marijuana reform, if you're a patient yourself, legally or illegally, and you've seen, at least anecdotally in your own life, that there's medicinal benefit, let science tell you exactly why that is, functionally, systematically, chemically, and 
those are the types of things that presidential leadership can do just by raising the bar, just by improving the conversation. And finally, having the federal government coordinate with states to get all of the information and all of the data that exists in states, exists among dispensaries. I've gone around the country and talked to a lot of dispensary owners. They don't go into these relationships with patients blindly. They take notes. They understand which strains help someone with MS, which strains help someone with an anxiety disorder, which strains help someone who has ALS or end-of-life issues. Um, they're getting data on what types of uh, cannabinoid profiles and what types of strains are doing this. It's time to coordinate that, and the best institution that can do that is a federal government that no longer turns its back on medical marijuana, but accepts it as a public policy that affects over half of Americans. Thank you. I'd like Senator Farley to come up. Thank you, everybody. It's uh, good to see so many people here um, out discussing this issue. Um, I am Senator Farley. I represent Senate District 8, and I do co-sponsor these bills with uh, Senator Segerbloom. We like to refer to each other as each other's better half on the marijuana issues. Um, and kind of going forward, I am um, very pleased to be working with Senator Segerbloom. He is the guy that continues to move the ball down the court and bring attention and get things like this done. And I'm kind of running around the background making pieces fit together so that we have a great policy here in Nevada. So I really appreciate every bit of opportunity I get to work with Senator Segerbloom and work with all of you. Um, I think my portion of today's presentation is to bring this back to Las Vegas and talk about some of the barriers and some of the things that are going on that are, are presenting some obstacles and probably talk a little bit about where we're going for the 2017 session. So some of the questions that have come out of the industry were the background checks, and that's been an obstacle to some of the dispensaries getting up and off the ground. And that actually came from 2002 legislation that was adopted into our Constitution that um, lawmakers did not want illegal drug users or people who had criminal backgrounds being able to grow marijuana and sell it and then create this black market. So from my perspective and from the support that I've had from the community and other legislators, that's no longer necessary. So we plan to see that change um, through in the 2017 uh, legislature. So that barrier will go. And I think that as we start talking about this issue from the medical standpoint, we need to start talking about it as medicine. There is no other medicine that you have to go and get a background check prior to purchasing. So in, the, in, in my opinion, there probably are some, and you probably, if anybody who follows me on social media knows which ones I think that you should have a background check on um, prior to getting those prescribed to you, but it's certainly not marijuana. And so I think we need to have common sense approach and a business approach about that section of the laws. And so hopefully we'll see those change in the 2017 legislature. The other thing that was interesting to me about this subject, and again, most of you know my first session was 2015, and um, I got to meet Senator Segerbloom, and I um, also run a business here in town. I'm in the construction industry. And the construction industry was so flat until the 2013 legislature passed medical marijuana. Then all of a sudden, we start seeing the um, rental and building industry going up, the commercial market space. All of a sudden, people are renting storefronts, they're renting um, warehouses, they're, there's activity going on. And then we start seeing build out. And nobody can really kind of put their finger on what's going on, but all of a sudden the economy is going up, people are working, there's good jobs being created. Um, and it was all the underneath of it was watching our Nevadans, our leaders in our communities, our business folks starting to invest in this industry. So it can't be ignored. Um, we have people we, we do tax benefits and um, abatements for companies to come here and hundreds of millions of dollars in, in abatements we give to people to come here. Yet we have our own business leaders who have put almost $300 million into this industry. These are Nevadans that have invested in Nevada and invested in this business. So this is something every legislator should take very seriously, wh whether you're pro or against. The reality is the people have spoken. Um, we have a le legal business opportunity here where people are taking risks every day. And as a business owner, I know what that feels like. Um, not to the $300 million level, but certainly that it's, um, it's very risky. So when we talk about some of the going forward on the economic standpoint, one of the um, issues that keep emerging for our state is medical marijuana um, tourism. So we do have a lot of people coming out of, from out of state. That we're, we're Nevada. We get 40 million people from every other state and country in the world. And to not allow 
people from outside of Nevada to purchase marijuana, medical marijuana today it is crazy. There's people that come here with all sorts of ailments, cancer, PSTD, HIV. These are folks that really need to continue their medical treatment that they may be on at home while they're visiting Nevada. So as I talk to the dispensary owners here in our state, these folks are um, very good businessmen. They understand the business that they're in, and they are taking the precautions to treat um, these folks accordingly. I do want to thank Dr. Cicely and John um, for talking about medical marijuana and the fact that we have to continue to do the research on it and create a medical grade of marijuana so that people know what they're purchasing, they know um, how to use it, and they know in what dosages to be taking it because right now we have potentially a cure or an assistance drug for somebody who's very ill who has no guidance on how to use it. And to me, that's a travesty. So um, and I, in, in all honesty, I have two children. You know, I watched the flock of parents move to Colorado to help their kids with seizures and other I issues and these miracle drugs, autism, that you know, they were taking cannabis oil and it was helping these kids. So um, I certainly understand that um, we have got to um, promote and, 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 and embrace research and policy change at the federal level. The other issue I think that's going to be great for uh, medical marijuana and the economy here in Nevada is um, medical marijuana tourism. And um, I think that um, it's going to be a great game changer here that as we start getting these dispensaries open and we're able to offer um, not only education but some of the world-class um, products and education and opportunities and experiences to people who visit Nevada, not only for our Nevadans, but people who come here. And let's just face it, I said this a long time ago when I first got involved with this, um, Las Vegas does vice industries extremely well. We are the benchmark for the rest of the world. So if anybody can get this right, it's Nevada. And so I want to thank everybody who continues to support, um, and it's a lot of the businessmen here that own these dispensaries or these grows, who continue to help support efforts like mine and some of the other um, folks and Senator Segerblooms to go out and make sure that we are benchmarking the right policies and getting the right information so that when people think about the Nevada marijuana industry, it's as world class as the gaming industry, and we have every ability to do that. So again, thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you for all coming and supporting this effort, and um, I'll be ready for questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Farley. Um, now, I'm extremely honored to be able to introduce Eugene Monroe. Um, he's an offensive tackle with the Ravens. Uh, as a former running back back in, way before his, he was born, um, I will say that the offensive line is the key to success for a running back and for any team. They are the most unsung heroes, but they are the ones that do all the work. And something like what he's doing now, which is sticking out, that's what they do. They, they, they are the ones who, who go out and, and push the envelope, and so I'm so proud to introduce them. First, I'll say uh, I'm definitely honored to, to share this platform with world-known doctors and, and people who are, are leading this great state of Nevada. I'm certainly honored to also be in you guys' presence. And I want to share uh, the reasons why I'm involved uh, in this industry and in my advocacy for marijuana policy reform. Uh, so. As you can see, I, my presentation isn't as scientific because I'm not a doctor. I'm, I'm a professional athlete, and I certainly don't want to overstep my boundaries in terms of uh, my knowledge and expertise. Uh, but two things that I am very uh, expert in are cannabis for pain and cannabis for brain. Uh, I, I st yeah. So I guess in, in terms of perspective, you can consider me a patient advocate. Uh, I've been playing football almost my entire life. Uh, this upcoming season will be my 19th year playing in general, my eighth season playing professionally. Uh, and if I'm sure everyone knows football. It's, it's the greatest game we have in our country. It's, it's the game that 
as parents, you want your children to play because there's so many intrinsic values that you learn through the struggles of playing the game, whether it's the rigors of continual practice and learning discipline, uh, teamwork, uh, team building, uh, relationship building, vital skills that you learn through this game uh, that enable you to transition into life and be a contrib contributing member to society. Uh, and fans love to watch the game. Why? Why, why do people love football? Because it's intense. Because they're big hits almost every play that are exciting. They get you standing out of your chair, screaming at your TV. You love to see it. You love to see the quarterback set up, throw the ball, and get blasted from his blind side. Hopefully that doesn't happen while I'm on the field protecting him. Uh, and, and football is so powerful in our country. From September to February, it owns a day of the week, Football Sunday. No matter if you're going to church, your pastor is likely talking about the upcoming game, whoever his favorite team may be. And it's exciting. Like I said, people jump out their seats. But what happens uh, when those exciting, enormous blows happen, people who are playing the game are experiencing a great deal of chronic pain and injury that most people don't want to hear about, right? Football players are paid a lot of money. They're, they're well compensated for what they do. But what people don't understand is the great deal of traumatic stress and injury that happen every time you see one of those big hits. Whether someone's laid out unconscious from sustaining a concussion or they're pushing through injuries that you cannot see. Uh, and this happens to me particularly almost every play. I play on the offensive line and there's literally a car crash Every time, every time the ball snapped, my head is smashing into the head of the defensive lineman. And we now know that this is causing a great deal of trauma for our brains. And this is something that when I started playing this game, this fact was unknown. It wasn't talked about at all. Uh, as I played longer, concussions became more of a big deal. Uh, the game is getting faster. Players are getting stronger. You see parents that if some of you have kids, you may even have your children specializing in football training at the age of five years old. Well, the game is going to continue to evolve. Players will continue to be stronger. And these hits are more devastating every time. In my position in particular, I take these blows every single play. And we're the biggest, strongest guys on the planet. So you would expect us to just accept this. And we do. We're trained to. We're trained to overcome adversity and play through a great deal of pain, things that many of you in these seats have no idea what it would be like to experience, let alone going to work, but performing athletically at the highest level. So an NFL lifestyle, like I said, repeated drills, plays, and hits that wear on your joints and muscles, and, and ultimately also your brain. You guys don't get to see the drill work that we do. You may see clips of practice, but the hits that we sustain in practice are no less detrimental than the hits that we sustain in the game. Our practices, in fact, are more severe than the games. We, our, our practice climate is such that you practice so hard that the game becomes a cakewalk. Like the game is easy for us on game day because we put so much in the practice, but all of those drills, lining up one-on-one -on -one as close as you can, directly blowing each other right in the head. And we know that these repeated head traumas are causing the onset of early brain issues that we shouldn't see in guys that are 40 years old. We shouldn't see in guys that are 30 years old. Uh, these are issues that normally rear themselves uh, for people who are in a later stage of life. Uh, and, and things that players deal with while they currently play. I'm 29 years old, and I've listed just a few things that, although I'm an active NFL player and I, I perform at the highest level of sports in our country, these are things that I experience on a daily basis. Getting out of bed every day. Like today, I woke up at 4.30 to go work out before I came here to see you guys. And it's a process just to wake your body up and get out of bed because of all the accumulated stress on, on, our, on my joints. Uh, walking up and down stairs. I've had one knee repaired three times. Uh, bending over, just playing with my kids, uh, picking my kids up. I have three kids, four, two, and one month old. And at times, depending on training or practice during that day, it's difficult to even be able to enjoy family life because I'm dealing with such a high level of stress and pain. And 
that's part of you know, why I'm advocating so openly because you guys don't get to experience or, or even understand what that's like. You see the end product. You see us battling on the field, which is awesome, and I love to do it. I'm not complaining by any means. Uh, in terms of pain, I know what I signed up for, but particularly in terms of my brain health, I had no clue that I was accumulating brain damage at such a rapid rate. To mitigate that pain, there is a process. So players are in pain every day, every play. And we have to stay on the field. It's our job. So NFL teams have to find a process that will allow us to continue to perform and push through this pain. And it's done by pharmaceuticals. It's done by prescribing us different uh, opioid drugs that you see I've listed, hydrocodone, oxycodone, oxycontin. Those are drugs that I've been prescribed personally. Uh, and a great deal of anti-inflammatory drugs too, like Celebrex, Cataflam, Indocin, Toradol, uh, which I explicitly uh, wrote about in a piece that I, I wrote to the Players' Tribune. Toradol is a drug that's prescribed for players before the game even happens to mask the pain that's ensuing on that day. And it's so powerful that you may be injured and not feel it for a day or two later after the drug wears off. And these are drugs that players are consuming and prescribed by their doctors every week, every day during the season. And I've also listed some drugs that I've been prescribed uh, on the advent of unfortunate concussions that I sustained. One, this past season, first drive of opening day, I was hit in the side of my head, direct blow, and I missed the rest of that game and three games after. And that event was so traumatic that for two weeks, I had to sit in a dark room and I didn't even know who I was for half the time. Uh, so things we know. So the climate of prescribing opioids in football mimic what's going on countrywide, but in fact, it's, it's more detrimental because we experience a great deal of chronic pain and chronic injury at a rate higher than the general population. So we're prescribed these dangerous pharmaceuticals much more frequently than the general population. And it's a problem. We see former players speak openly about their addiction issues to these pills while they played and also when they're not playing anymore because one, that pain that, and those injuries that they sustain during their career continue after they're done. Once you stop playing football, it doesn't stop hurting. Th those injuries, if you've fallen off your bike or unfortunately been in any accident, you know that you deal with these things for the rest of your life and it's no different for an athlete. And so, so here I am uh, advocating, <laughs> advocating because I believe, I believe that in cannabis we have something that's far safer than the opioids that we're being prescribed as athletes, far safer than these powerful anti-inflammatory drugs that are masking injury, uh, masking pain, and allowing people to continue to play through these things and further damaging their bodies. And in fact, there was a time when they linked toward all usage to excess brain bleeding and teams made players sign waivers to wipe themselves clean of prescribing players toward, toward all uh, in the event that anything adverse in the event of a concussion that led to excess brain bleeding uh, would happen. So this is very vital to me. This is, I've sustained four documented concussions while I've been in the NFL, uh, missed time for two of them and probably had many more traumatic events. Not probably, definitely, because every time I block a defender on the field, I'm experiencing traumatic brain stress every single time. We know that cannabis is safer. It's less addictive than these opioids. And people are even breaking their addiction to opioids by using cannabis. We need to take... <laughs> We need to take a serious look at this. We need hardcore research like Dr. Sue Sisley is pursuing to show us whether or not this is something real, but we know through evidence that people are being healed by using cannabis all over our country, here in the state of Nevada and in other states as well. The NFL shouldn't test players for, med for marijuana. They shouldn't. It's far safer than the drugs that they're currently prescribing us players. 
at mitigating pain, at dealing with issues that are not talked about, anxiety, depression, things that you hear former players talk about, but current players are afraid to because we're warriors, we're gladiators. No one wants to hear about your pain. No one wants to hear about your anxiety for the upcoming game. No one wants to hear about the depression you experience when you're released from a team and your life's work is in the balance. No one wants to hear about that. But we do know that people are experiencing a great deal of relief for some of those very things in cannabis. So I'm fully supportive of any and all research that's going to show whether or not, like, like Sue said, is this good? Is this bad? If you think it's bad, let's find out if it's bad. Let's, let's not block the ability to look at this any longer. And if you believe that that these patients are telling you the truth, that they're receiving great benefits from this, let's find out why. Let's find out exactly what pathways cannabis is working in our bodies to present these great benefits to everyone who's said that they've experienced it in their lives.